Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I think we'll go ahead and start, maybe just a minute early. And uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, as I just announced, if you had just walked in, they are overflowing to room 256 just down the hall. Uh, if you want to sit, other than that, it'll be a little tight. Um, by the vagaries of, of the meeting, you never quite know which room size you're going to get. And I apologize that uh, this room is not a little bit bigger, but we are overflowing to room 256. If they'd have only known that Dr. Stolding was talking, they would have adjusted. <laughs> so uh, I'm Mark Warner. I'm president of the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation. Uh, thrilled to be here uh, to present Dr. Stolding, but also to present something I'd like to start with, and that is we all know Dr. Pierce. Um, Dr. Pierce is legendary in our specialty for his dedication to patient safety and his leadership of ASA and APSF. And in his honor, we have an Ellison C. Pierce Jr. Patient Safety uh, Award, and it's given out for the best abstract presented at the ASA annual meeting here. Uh, Shubi, would you mind coming up? And uh, Maria, would you all come up? And uh, these two wonderful folks um, did a wonderful job of uh, developing the, the award and running the thing. So uh, uh, Maria Van Pelt is a member of the executive committee of the APSF. And Shubi, uh, Got a call. Excuse me. Yes, thank you. Judy, thank you. Um, is the chair at the uh, at University of Massachusetts and also runs uh, the uh, abstract review committee for patient safety. And they put this all together and a uh, winner has been selected. Would one of you like to announce it? I don't have my glasses on, so <laughs> Without your glasses, well, let Shuby do it. Shuby, just please step forward. So it's a real honor to have collaborated. Um, between our committee and the APSF. I'm very appreciative to have the opportunity and was a very competitive, we had a record number of submissions and I'm just delighted to announce the winner. It's Dr. Crystal Woodward and I don't know if she's she in the audience, but that's great. read out the title. It's a simulation study to evaluate improvements in anesthesia work environment contamination following implementation of a bundle of interventions. Really fascinating um, study and I'm hoping many in the audience will come to hear the presentation. Yeah, that's so great. Parties, congratulations. Thank you very much. Something about a thorn between three roses. <laughs> ah, great. The next generation of patient safety people continue. So I have just one announcement. To, well, a couple more people have walked in. There's an overflow room in room 256 if you'd rather sit um, just down the hall. Um, I'm to announce right now that uh, this session is designated for maintenance of certification patient safety part one credit for a live session. Did our lights disappear? Or was it just my eyes? Uh, so I, I guess if you want to get uh, MOCA uh, patient safety part two credit, uh, this is good for it. So thank you for being here for that. Now, the star of the show is Dr. Stolding. The 2017 ASA APSF Ellison C. Pierce Patient Safety Memorial Lecture is going to be delivered by Dr. Robert K. Stolding, MD. Dr. Stolding has chosen the topic, Anesthesia Patient Safety, Closing the Gap Between Perception and Reality for this particular lecture. This honorary lecture was established by the APSF and ASA to recognize and sustain the memory of the founding president of APSF and our past president of the ASA, Ellison G. Pierce, Jr. It was Dr. Pierce's vision and unwavering commitment for anesthesia patient safety that led to the formation of the APSF in 1985 as the first medical specialty foundation devoted solely to patient safety. Today, anesthesiology, ASA, and APSF are recognized as pioneers in patient safety and advocating as APSF has strived for its vision that no patient shall be harmed by anesthesia. 
Dr. Stolting is a native of Indiana and a graduate of the Indiana University School of Medicine. He completed his anesthesia residency at the University of California School of Medicine in San Francisco and subsequently served in the U.S. Public Health Service and at the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Stolting is one of the grandmasters of our specialty. Uh, he's one of my personal heroes and, and it's like a father to me and I, I'm incredibly dedicated, uh, happy to be able to do this and introduce Dr. Stolting. Over his illustrious career, he has served in many key leadership roles, including professor and chair of the Department of Anesthesia at the Indiana University School of Medicine. He's been vice president of scientific affairs at ASA, president and, uh, of the American Board of Anesthesiology and continuing that role of education. He also chaired the Anesthesiology Residency Review Committee of the ACGME. He's also been a director of the Foundation for Anesthesia Education and Research and 19 years served as president of the APSF. So an underachiever by any means, Bob. Uh, in addition, Dr. Stolting has been one of the world's most prolific authors and lecturers. He has four major textbooks, four major textbooks in the specialty that are all bestsellers for over three years, uh, three decades, all of which are at least their fifth edition. He has refresher course uh, lectures at ASA on property fasting, risk of pulmonary aspirations, et cetera, have continued for more than a quarter of a century, I think making you the longest serving refresher course speaker, Bob, for ASA ever. Dr. Stolting has served as president, I mentioned, of APSF for 19 years, has left a legacy uh, that, that has impacted all of us and so many of our patients. Bob, thank you for coming and joining us. It's my honor to welcome Dr. Bob Stolting. Well, thank you, Dr. Warner, and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's truly uh, an honor for me to be uh, invited to present this 2017 APSF ASA Ellison C. Pierce Memorial Lecture. I had the uh, good fortune of uh, following Dr. Pierce as president of APSF. I had the good fortune of knowing Jeep as a mentor, uh, as a colleague, as a trusted personal friend. There's no question that uh, he was a visionary of his time. His vision, his persistence was the result or the reason that the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation indeed became reality. And it's the reason that today we look at anesthesia patient safety the way we are able to. Now I've chosen uh, as my topic this morning or this afternoon, uh, anesthesia patient safety closing the gap between perception and reality. And I want to uh, address this topic from the following uh, four uh, bullet points. Begin with an observation. Early in the history of APSF in the late 1970s, 19, early 1980s, when the foundation was being discussed as a concept, there was a notion that if anesthesia is so safe, a perception if you will, why did we need a patient safety foundation? Well, the reality was anesthesia could be safer. Remember, this is the era before even the introduction of pulse oximetry or capnography. This was an era of spiraling liability insurance costs because of tragic accidents, unrecognized ventilator disconnects, unrecognized esophageal intubation. So there was a lot of room for improved anesthesia safety. The second bullet point, uh, I want to share with you what I think is a very proud chapter in our society's history. The history of the formation of APSF is indeed something that is a story that needs to be told and retold. It's something that I think we need to pass on to the next generation. It's been said that APSF began as a result of a perfect storm. Three independent, unrelated events coming together 
the right place, at the right time, to create an environment that was receptive, both in the public's view and among anesthesiologists, for a safety foundation. And at the same time, I want to share with you a, a, a what-if moment in history. If history had gone the other direction, it's a very real possibility that the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation would have never occurred. And then again, safety as we know it today in anesthesia would be very different. And then finally, uh, I want to discuss how can behaviors, best practices, reduce the risk of anesthesia? How can these best practices become reality? And finally, uh, share with you my view of how your role can be utilized effectively to help close the loop, if you will, to close the gap between what we know and what we do. Now let me quickly share with you uh, this early history because I think it's a, a chapter that we can all be very proud of and, and certainly share. The perfect storm was three events. One was the power of the press and public opinion, a very positive impact, a liability insurance crisis, and a leader in the right place at the right time. Now let me uh, share with you uh, this first uh, power of the uh, press. There was a deep sleep documentary entitled 6,000 will die or suffer brain damage. This was in April of 1982, an ABC News documentary. I'm going to share with you a, a very brief video clip from that documentary, and I think you'll sense how this could arouse public awareness or raise public awareness and certainly raise public opinion of the risk of anesthesia. General anesthesia, safe most of the time, but there are dangers from human error, carelessness, and a critical shortage of anesthesiologists. This year, 6,000 patients will die or suffer brain damage. Tom Gerald looks at the risks you may take when you go into the deep sleep. Here with a report on the dangers of this deep sleep is Tom Gerald. Tom? Hugh, the medical statistics are imprecise, but it is generally accepted that accidents experienced by patients under general anesthesia kill or critically injure up to 6,000 people a year. And many, many more experience serious side effects which go totally unreported, such as paralysis, cardiac arrest, or liver damage. Well, following that, we have uh, the second part of the perfect storm, a liability insurance crisis. Malpractice premiums were excessively, uh, almost prohibitively expensive or not even available. So certainly this created an environment among anesthesiologists that would be more receptive to anything that might help reduce cost of insurance. And the third component of that perfect storm was the ASA Committee on Patient Safety and Risk Management. The visionary behind this was Dr. Pierce, that's first vice president of ASA. This was the first professional society committee with a name that included patient safety. So we had a leader in the right place at the right time. And in 1985, as you've heard, uh, the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation uh, became a reality, no longer a perception. I'd share with you uh, a step back a little bit. Uh, the original APSF executive uh, committee uh, consisted of these seven individuals and it illustrates the unique feature of APSF at that time and continuing today of being very inclusive of all the stakeholders with respect to patient safety. On the far <coughs> left is Dr. Nicholas Gravenstein, University of Florida. The next uh, gentleman is Dr. Jeffrey Cooper. Jeff is an engineer. He's still on the APSF Executive Committee as a, an Executive Vice President. That's his photo just below his uh, picture in 1986. Jeff has made innumerable contributions to patient safety. Dr. Rick Syker, next to Dr. Cooper, a past president of ASA. Next to them is Dr. J or Mr. James Holzer, who is risk management, professional liability, emphasizing now the stakeholders are beginning to expand beyond just caregivers. 
Dr. Pierce and the next two gentlemen are Bert Dole, who was president of Puritan Bennett at the time, and Mr. Deacon Roundtree, who was president of Ohio Medical. Uh, both these individuals made significant financial contributions to get APSF off the ground. So the corporate world has been an incredibly important partner for patient safety and anesthesia for the history of the foundation. The vision of APSF in 1985 or 1986 and still today is that no patient shall be harmed by anesthesia. Now let me share with you this what if moment in history. Uh, there's so many things in, in history that you wonder if they'd gone the other way, what would have happened? Well, there's this for the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation as well. Thinking in terms, is a safety foundation really needed? And I want to share with you a, a video clip from the 25th anniversary celebration of APSF and the comments by Mr. Michael Scott, who was the uh, attorney, ASA attorney, who worked with Dr. Pierce in organizing the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation. And his comments uh, at the, uh, the anniversary are, uh, I think, uh, very intriguing. Uh, Dr. Stolting uh, has told you about the early history of the APSF. Uh, he left out something. Uh, and when I went to review the APS files last week, uh, I discovered the thing that he had left out, and I would like to share it with you. Uh, this is a letter to Jeep written by uh, the president of the American Medical Association on AMA stationery. Uh, uh, the president shall go nameless. It's a little hard to read here, so forgive me. Dear Ellison, you can already tell that they have a close working relationship. <laughs> Your interest and demonstrated concern over patient safety is widely acknowledged and appreciated. So far, so good. <laughs> I share with you the conviction that great strides can be made in professional liability by focusing attention on patients and how to protect them both from negligence uh, and untoward events. Still okay. As I suggested to you over the telephone, I and others here at AMA have some reservations about the establishment of an anesthesia patient safety foundation. I'm starting to get into trouble here. First, and probably the least important concern, is that it creates another level of potential bureaucracy, and the diverse groups involved clearly would have different agendas and expected results. More significantly, such a foundation might send a signal to the public and our adversaries uh, that we now believe that patient safety is so unsafe as to require such special attention. Uh, funding, I'm sorry, funding, consistent, funding considerations uh, aside, such a foundation might well be duplicative and divert attention from a comprehensive endeavor. Now the letter goes on to uh, extol the virtues of the patient safety uh, organization uh, being, um, being fostered by the AMA. Well, this is a roundabout way of suggesting that the proposal you make to dilute efforts already underway could be seen as protective of anesthesiology at the expense of others and could send the wrong message to the public. I need not remind you of how rapidly such activities become bureaucracies. Uh, I, I wonder, as I read this letter, whether if Chief had followed this advice, uh, anesthesia patient safety uh, would have really reached the levels that it has 25 years after the foundation of APSF. As my daughters would say, duh, I don't think so. Thank you. Well, Dr. Pierce did not follow that advice. We dodged that bullet. And you'll see in a moment uh, in a 1991 interview with Dr. Pierce at the Wood Library, Jeep very clearly articulated his 
goals for the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation and his vision for anesthesia safety? Well, I think we wanted to do three things. We wanted to make anesthesia safe for everybody, as safe as possible. But we wanted to do this in two directions, to provide funds for research in anesthesia and to provide a communication outlet so that people who had thought about safety mechanisms, who had written about safety mechanisms, who understood safety mechanisms, could communicate that. <coughs> well, doesn't everybody? Drips no. and Van Dan, you and Roundtree and Syker, almost everybody who succeeds, I think, is a hard worker. You know, one of my favorite axioms is that the world is peopled by three groups, those who make things happen, those who watch things happen, and those who wonder what happened. I hope I fit in there first. <laughs> but we all should. Patients should not die from anesthesia. Anesthesia is here to provide pain relief for the patient to undergo surgery. And there should never be a second agenda for anesthesia. Well, we've covered uh, the first two bullet points that I wanted to share uh, with you. I want now to Look at uh, the last two bullet points. How can behaviors that reduce the risk of anesthesia, behaviors that at least are a perception at this stage, become best practices a reality? And I want to share with you uh, my view of what your role can be in helping uh, close the loop, close the gap between what we know and what we do with respect to certain safety initiatives where there's still uh, work to be done. Well, let me uh, start with, uh, if you will, a success story. Uh, APSF can identify safety issues. We can give them visibility. We provide education. We serve as an advocate for safety changes. But APSF does not create standards. We don't have dues-paying members. We depend upon ultimately closing the loop to be from a variety of mechanisms, and certainly one of which are your professional associations. In 2004, APSF identified a safety issue in that <coughs> physiological alarms were often being turned off or were no longer audible in the operating room because of background noise. Now that background noise was often characterized as music. But in fact, we then were able to go from there with conferences, newsletter articles, surveys, meeting with leadership of the ASA, and ultimately, the standards for basic anesthetic monitoring were amended in October of 2010 as a direct result of the safety initiative that had been started, initiated by APSF. So to me, this is a success story. It shows how one can close the loop on a safety issue. I've said this often that evidence-based data is not necessary for acceptance of a safety practice. One will never be able to have randomized, blinded studies for rare, adverse events. <coughs> Pulse oximetry became a standard of care, not because of proof that it reduced adverse outcomes, but rather because it exhibited compelling theoretical benefit without harm. Safety is doing the right thing because it makes sense. And quoting from an article on evidence-based medicine several years ago, Referring to anesthesia, the comment was made that improved anesthesia patient safety <coughs> reflects doing a number of little things that in the aggregate make a big difference. Closing the loop for APSF safety initiatives. What about those initiatives where the loop has not been closed? And I'd like to share with you examples, but let me first share this background with you. It's been my experience that as you'll see with the safety initiatives, that identifying the risk is not the problem. 
Identifying who's at risk for a fire is not the problem. Recognizing the possible solution to the safety risk is not the problem. The problem is closing the loop between the safety risk, its solution, and acceptance of practices. And acceptance of practices becomes changes in behavior, investment in technology that will reduce the risk of an adverse event. And I'm going to uh, characterize this as the dangerous intersection phenomenon. Everyone realizes the intersection is just an accident waiting to happen, but nothing's happened yet. And stoplights are expensive, funds are limited, and it's hard to make that investment without evidence. Well, many of the safety issues in anesthesia, I think, fall into this category of the dangerous intersection phenomenon. All too often, changes in behavior, changes in practice, investment in technology does not occur until after the event has taken place. And you and I can take a role in trying to close the loop before the dangerous intersection phenomena becomes a reality. What are the steps that we have available to us? In dealing with safety initiatives, I suggest to you that certainly endorsement by professional associations, your ASA, your standards, more likely today's reality, practice guidelines or practice advisories, become a mechanism where best practices are endorsed. APSF has certainly worked from the point of creating awareness among individuals, doing this with conferences, written reports in the uh, newsletter, as you'll see in a moment, educational videos, and most recently, uh, social media. The third bullet point that I think is probably the largest untapped opportunity for closing the loop our acceptance is best practices by large anesthesia groups and practice management companies. One size does not fit all. Not every safety initiative is relevant to everyone's practice. But if in your group you're doing patients who are at risk for fire, it shouldn't be a matter of individual decision that there's discussion about how supplemental oxygen is delivered. I think the large groups need to get together, sit down, reason through it, and agree that there will be a protocol for dealing with this sort of thing, and everyone has to follow that protocol. Same could be said in a moment, I will, about monitoring neuromuscular blockade. And finally, we're even in an era now where patients are very educated, and it wouldn't be out of the question that a patient might ask you, am I at risk for a fire during the, the surgery on my eyelid or on my forehead? Will I need oxygen? Am I at risk for a fire? That should send a flag that you need to be thinking about this safety issue. I leave you with this and I'll come back to it in the, past, or in the future. Only you ultimately can be the ones that help close the loop. How does APSF advocate for these safety initiatives that I'm going to uh, use as examples? I suggest to you there are really three strategies. Uh, one has been articles in the newsletter Experts conferences where reports are disseminated via the newsletter, and then educational videos and social media. So I want to use these three examples or, social, or strategies to show you how they can be applied to some safety initiatives where closing the gap remains an unachieved <clears throat> success. Medication safety has been a, a focus for the Patient Safety Foundation for several years. There have been a number of uh, conferences, multidisciplinary. There has been a, uh, a, a educational video that has been widely utilized. And as a result of this advocacy for safety and medication delivery, APSF has recommended the following acronym. And again, this is not one size fits all, but if your group, your practice, this was relevant, even parts of it, if this were adopted, this would help close the loop. This is the STPC paradigm, where we feel that safety and medication delivery could be improved by standardization. There are just too many drugs and doses and concentrations that everybody independently has 
currently in some areas at least the right to want next to them during anesthesia. We have to give up some individual discretion. <laughs> Technology, certainly barcoding, automated records may or may not be viewed by everybody as advanced in technology, but these are examples of how we could improve medication safety. Perhaps the, the most controversial part of the acronym is the, the pharmacy pre-filled, pre-mixed. The point of care versus pre-filled, pre-mixed. My bias is that you and I probably should limit how often we are mixing drugs at the bedside. These should be pre-filled, pre-mixed. I think this would reduce the likelihood or risk of medication error. And not unique to medication safety is culture. But certainly with respect to medication error, this applies. We have to get into an era where we uh, learn from our errors, like the airline industry, report errors, learn from them. We must get away from the culture of identify, punish, and blame, or identify, blame, and punish. So closing the loop here, again, professional associations may play a role. I think APSF has used the strategies available to the APSF to make this a safety initiative. Once more, perhaps large groups, if parts or all of the STPC paradigm fits, endorsement of that as a best practice would go towards closing the loop. Are we there yet? The answer is no. Fires in the operating room. My non-anesthesia friends are shocked when they hear that, I mean, I could catch on fire in the operating room? That's just unthinkable. But I'm going to go out on a limb and say that I think flash fires in the operating room are 100% preventable in at-risk patients. And it's all about how you and I deliver supplemental oxygen. Who's at risk for a fire? Any patient with surgery above the shoulders in the presence of an oxidizer-enriched environment, which you and I create with open delivery of oxygen and a heat source and fuel, is at risk for a fire. In APSF, uh, Hundreds please, of surgical uh, fires occur in the uh, United States plan. each year. Preventing these fires requires teamwork and an understanding of the very real hazards of using oxygen in the operating room. Sleepy and comfortable now, Andrew? Okay, everything's going fine. Are we ready to drape for now? Not yet, Dr. Rooney. We use an alcohol based prep. It's Notice the expression on his face. Okay, can we please have our timeout for patient safety? This is Andrew Smith, MR number 5501328. He's having a right submandibular lesion excision, possible deplasty. Everyone agree? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Surgical fires continue to occur. It's all about oxygen. We've emphasized this uh, repeatedly with articles in the newsletter, and APSF has made recommendations. And I never thought I'd say this, but oxygen is not the right answer. The traditional practice of open delivery of 100% oxygen should be discontinued in patients at risk for a fire. If open delivery of oxygen is necessary, give the lowest concentration of oxygen possible that would maintain an acceptable saturation, less than 30%. If you need more than 30%, you should secure the airway. Now, in an attempt to see if indeed uh, we were making an impact with our education and our videos, we surveyed uh, those who had asked for a copy of the fire safety video, and 
There had been some 10,000 requests for this copy. Now, near this many were surveyed, but we asked them a number of questions, and I wanted to share the response to two questions with you. The first question was, before viewing the APSF fire safety video, how did you manage delivery of oxygen, supplemental oxygen, to patients at risk for a fire? And the far orange or the far left uh, column, I, at least from my perspective, shows that about 40% of those responding said they gave open delivery of oxygen by a face mask or cannula, even to patients at risk. The blue bar suggests or said that they would limit the open delivery of oxygen unless it was more than 30 percent. If it was more than 30 percent, then they would secure the airway, the purple column. We then ask, after viewing the video, did you change your practice? Now, ideally, if indeed we made an impact, the first orange bar would go way down, the blue one would stay the same, and the purple one would go go up significantly. Well, before you shout from the mountain, we really haven't closed the loop here. This is an incredibly biased group. They had the initiative to ask for the video. They even went the next step of showing the initiative to respond to a survey. So if we think that this demonstrates that we've changed behavior, we've closed the loop, I think we are unfortunately mistaken, and there is evidence to show that that's true. Continuing up, probably as recently as a few weeks ago, there are exposés on the news, typically of the 6 o'clock news of an operating room fire. So fires continue to be a risk, and only you can make a difference. And if there's ever an example of the problem of closing the loop, where we know the problem, we know the solution, but can't get the practice changed, doctor, do you agree that administering open delivery oxygen for the removal of an eyelid lesion increased the risk of fire? Yes, but I always give oxygen. So here again, I say the problem, identifying the problem is not the problem, recognizing the solution is not the problem. This is a classic intersection, dangerous intersection phenomenon. I don't know how many times I've been asked to look at these cases, and I can assure you every time after the event, practices change. Our goal is to change practice before the event. Another safety initiative that has been addressed by APSF over several years deals with monitoring neuromuscular blockade. I've often said that no resident ever left my training program who hadn't monitored neuromuscular blockade objectively with a nerve stimulator every time the nerve stimulator and every time neuromuscular blocker was used. And the first day they walked into private practice, they stopped using the nerve stimulator. And for reasons that totally escape me, this is an evidence-based safety net that has little or no risk associated with it. APSF has certainly made this a safety initiative, advocating for objective monitoring. We did a survey among uh, both anesthesiologists, nurse anesthetists, and AAs, and you can see when asked, uh, 90 percent agreed that objective functional monitoring, twitch measurement, a neuromuscular blockade should be utilized routinely. So it's something we all agree on. Do we do it? Another survey showed that the respondents were willing to say that they rarely, nearly 70 percent rarely, monitored neuromuscular blockade. I even tried to chide my colleagues into monitoring neuromuscular blockade with an editorial in the newsletter. Knowing what you know or should know, how would you feel if you were the patient? Would you want neuromuscular blockade to be monitored? And I can only uh, leave this uh, with the recognition that the loop is not closed, but there is no compelling reason to ignore this as an evidence-based safety issue. 
that the obvious change in practice, monitoring with a peripheral nerve stimulator, would likely reduce the risk of potential adverse effects from lingering effects of muscle relaxants. So again, falls on you. Professional associations may well, in the near future, write a practice advisory that includes objective monitoring. I think APSF has done their share in, in educating and making this a visible safety initiative. But once more, as I mentioned earlier, perhaps the large groups could, as a group, it doesn't have to be 100%, I suspect there will always be someone who feels that they don't need to monitor neuromuscular blockade. But ultimately, you have to be willing to give up some of that authority and if you practice in this hospital, in this group, we monitor neuromuscular blockade. A safety issue, again, that uh, I want to share with you as an example of clearly one where the loop has not been closed, is opioid-induced ventilatory impairment and monitoring PCA postoperatively. APSF once more has uh, had conferences, newsletter articles, <laughs> And I think a very compelling uh, educational video, I want to show you uh, clips from the conference and that educational video. My daughter Leah was incredible. She was the life of our family. As I look back, she was not on any monitors. This was so avoidable. Had she been on a monitor, um, they would have detected that her breathing was deteriorating. And monitoring is, is so easy nowadays. I mean, the, the new technology is so simple, you know, and inexpensive and not invasive. And to find somebody dead in bed is inexcusable. I knew I couldn't live my life and not do something. I've made the goal of continuous post-operative monitoring my commitment, all that stands between us and universal post-op monitoring is the will to require it. In my opinion, all patients should be monitored. So I know it's complicated. I'm sure it is far more complicated than I understand. But anesthesia has tackled tough problems before. We need to move forward on this in the most expeditious way possible. We are required to have continuous monitoring system if it's your goal to prevent every possible death. Who should be monitored? Everyone. I think pulse ox at a minimum uh, is required. I think the barrier, um, the technology is not perfect, I agree. Um, but the barrier, I think, is not the technology. It is the will to have, um, to reduce to zero um, the number of adverse events and the will to spend the money to do. Now, on the basis of this uh, Educare Safety Initiative, uh, our conferences, our newsletter articles, uh, the video, APSF has made recommendations for a change in practice or best practices. And you can see the recommendation is that all patients should have oxygenation monitored with pulse oximetry, that one needs to assess the need for supplemental oxygen, one needs to use capnography as supplemental oxygen is required. And I submit to you that this is the poster child for the gap between what we know and how we practice. To me, it's a classic example of the dangerous intersection phenomena where all too often the adverse event occurs before the change in behavior takes place. Several years ago, I was asked to present APSF's recommendations for monitoring that I've just shown you to a group of hospital representatives, academic, private practice, VA hospitals. And after I presented these recommendations, uh, immediately the question was asked, well, what's the evidence that this is going to be cost effective? And I must admit, I, I sort of had a trite response. I had two responses. One is that you'll never be able to get randomized evidence for rare adverse events. But the real telling evidence that this would be cost effective are grieving families and tombstones. The final safety initiative I want to share with you that uh, still needs some 
closure as far as uh, becoming best practices deals with uh, distractions in the operating room. This used to be reading, now it's advanced in technology to the internet and cell phones and a number of other, other high-tech distractions. APSF, uh, or rather ASA, has an excellent statement on distractions. If this is an issue in your practice, you have an excellent resource in this statement. And I think its value is that it recognizes that one size does not fit all. You have to look at your unique needs and resources and find what will work best for you. And I often say the litmus test is, if you were the patient, would you be comfortable or happy or feel secure or safe with the policy that you're adopting? APSF, uh, as an example of an experts conference, which is held annually, where approximately 100 attendees are present who have specific unique interests in the topic and this topic in 2016 indeed was distractions in the work environment and the impact on patient safety and with this uh, 100 attendees we were able to use an audience response system where one could vote on a question and then see very quickly how their views corresponded with their colleagues. And I want to show you just uh, two or three examples of the responses to the questions where, again, perception becomes reality. Many of the distractions in the anesthesia workplace or environment are inherent to patient care. And that's a critically important point to keep in mind. It's not the internet and cell phone always. It's something that's part of what we're doing to take care of patients. 92% of the attendees agreed, and electronic records have probably found their way on everybody's list of an example of a distraction. Use of personal electronic devices for non-patient care activities creates a negative perception of our clinical vigilance. 95% of the attendees agreed with that. 100%, even in the absence of a causal relationship, use of a personal electronic device, and that's of course cell phone, internet, or whatever, that is temporarily related or associated with an adverse event will be more difficult to defend. And to support that view, the speaker, uh, Mr. Brian Thomas, an attorney, defense attorney, had the following observation and comments. In the last five years, uh, we have seen a, a developing trend of um, <clears throat> cases involving allegations and evidence of distractions in the OR and other anesthesia workplace environments um, that are being asserted by the plaintiff's bar and it's been a very effective tool for them. Uh, even the mere suggestion or perception that you all are distracted oftentimes is enough to significantly negatively impact our ability as defense attorneys to defend you? Well, perception clearly became reality. In summary, uh, APSF does not write standards. We create education, awareness. We advocate for safety practices. We see seeking evidence-based solutions for a safety practice is not necessary for acceptance of a safety practice. Pulse oximetry. Safety is doing the right thing because it makes sense. <clears throat> Closing the loop, as I've emphasized so often, identifying the problem is not the problem, identifying the risk is not the problem. Recognizing the possible solution is not the problem. The problem is closing the loop between the risk, its solution, and acceptance of practices that will reduce the risk of an adverse event. Your role, again, professional associations, as an individual, in a group or individually, as a member of the professional association, once again, large group practices, I think, have an incredibly potentially valuable role in closing the loop on safety practices. 
To quote from Dr. Pierce, uh, patient safety is not a fad, is not a preoccupation of the past, it's not an objective that has been fulfilled or a reflection of a problem that has been solved. It is an ongoing necessity that must be sustained by research, training, and daily application in the workplace. Only you can close the loop. Thank you for your attention. I hope my comments are a fitting memory to Dr. Pierce.